Anyway, it's so good to see all of you. I've run into a lot of people that I've seen in the past and a lot of people that I love that were my patients that um, still threaten me. So if you see anybody ready to beat me up on the way out, please help me. <laughs> um, you know, I, I tried to, to look at a lot of different things because, you know, you don't want to hear the same thing every time. So, and I... I, I want to go over some statistics with you just because it's always good to hear those things. But I also want to go over with some, some of the new things that are out that you may or may not be aware of. Uh, there's been a lot of changes in healthcare over the past five years since COVID has been out. And there's a whole different view of, of insurances, there's a whole different view of, of medical care, um, just a lot of things that I want to touch base with you a little bit. I, this is a very flexible and open talk here. If you have a question in the middle of something, just raise your hand. Um, I'd rather catch you, you know, while you're thinking about it. Because for the first time that I've ever done lectures, I have notes. <laughs> I never used to do this. After I hit 60, it was like, oh my god, i got to write notes. <laughs> so, and it's not so much for you guys, it's for me to kind of keep in line. Anyway, so we're going to talk a little bit about women's heart health. Um, but before we start, I want to talk a little bit about some of the statistics on women's health. We have been a group of individuals that up until probably the 90s have been neglected on research studies and on really basic medical care because all of the studies have always been done on men and we just don't fit into that peg. So they finally developed a study and I think most of you probably have heard me talk about it before, before it's called the Framingham study. And the Framingham study is a group of 25,000 nurses that they followed for 40 years to actually develop what and how we treat women's health now. So by doing that study, we've had, they've actually saved a lot of lives. But interestingly enough, we're still we're just not where we need to be on women's health care. So just some statistics. Um, this is a study that came out from the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, uh, just at the end of 2021. So doing their their research, doing the demographics. There's 15% of women over the age of 18 are still classified as fair to poor health. 15%. 20% of women, this is all over the age of 18, 20% of women use alcohol more than three times a week. 20%, only 20% of women in that age group actually exercise to get two and a half hours per weekend. We're only 20%. 10% are smokers. 42% are obese. 46%, this is greater than 18, 46% have hypertension. 10% of women less than the age of 65 do not have health care or health care insurance. 10%. That's one out of every nine. That's one person at every table wouldn't have health care. 20% um, of women over the age of 50 have osteoporosis. Only 50% of women in the United States see a dentist. That's over the age of 50. 6% have coronary artery disease, which is one in every 16 women have heart disease. Greater than 50% of women who had gestational hypertension or gestational diabetes develop heart disease. 50%. And the interesting thing is too, that heart disease is the number one killer in new moms. So the Mother who has hyperten gestational hypertension, eclampsia, or um, diabetes. And so that's 33%. And that's higher in black women. It's almost 48% of new moms that are 
black that had cardiac disease died. For a number of reasons. Number one, they don't have good health care. They don't have good prenatal. So talking a little bit about what the risk factors are uh, for heart disease. Everyone, we always know that men are probably the, our biggest risk factor for heart disease. Because they drive us crazy. <laughs> I always tell people you can't, you can't live with them, you can't kill them. So you got to like, deal with them. At my, my table, I was just telling them, I said, you better find me another one of those little blue things because Gary's stealing it as soon as I get home. <laughs> um, so looking at the risk factors for heart disease in women, we always think about those things that are kind of slapping us in the face. You know, being a smoker, being overweight, um, not eating right. But some of the biggest risk factors, and the one I want to talk about in depth, is one that has all the new studies out, and it's on menopause. So menopause does not directly cause heart disease. It's all the problems that come with menopause. Now here's a good one, ladies, are you ready? One third of our life is spent in perimenopause all the way through menopause. So if you live to be 90, 30 years are gonna be going through menopause or having post-menopause problems. They have never done studies on this up until like the 10, last 10 years. So they're finding that as we go through menopause, it's not just that emotional stuff that's going on. 90% of women who have menopause symptoms will have insomnia, fatigue, weight gain, depression, irritable bowel, you, well, you pee when you don't want to, <laughs> and some of them even will have a sleep apnea. So if you look at all of those problems that come from going through menopause, you know, those are the problems that will cause heart disease. So if you have a sleep disorder, and this is why, you know, you don't have to be obese to have a sleep disorder. And those of you who are seeing your doctors and they talk about, you know, what your sleep patterns are and if you have insomnia and, you know, what kind of things, are you sleeping seven to nine hours per night, which is what they recommend. Who sleeps seven to nine hours a night? <laughs> if I sleep nine hours, you might just leave me there because I can't get up. <laughs> um, but the, the thing with a, with a sleep apnea, they have found that people who have sleep apnea, which is you have difficulty breathing at night, say you fall asleep, you're a big snorer, or you have um, apnea, which means that you don't have breaths through the night. A lot of people will say they wake themselves up, they're going <laughs> like that, so you're trying to catch your breath. That's a form of sleep apnea. Or your partner will tell you, you know, you snore really bad and I have to wake you up at night. That is that is the number one indicator for the development of hypertension, diabetes, and um, uh, weight gain. So people who are obese or gaining weight, if they have sleep apnea and it's not treated, it's like a, a vicious circle. So. The other thing I wanted to talk about, which is which is a new finding, because most of you will remember years ago when you had to when you were, your doctor wanted to put you on hormonal therapy. You know, let's do estrogen, let's do testosterone, let's do all those things. Do you remember how nobody ever paid for it? Insurance has never paid for that. Medicare never paid for that up until just about five or six years ago when they started covering it. And they found that women who are eligible for hormonal replacement therapy actually do better as we age. So that decreases our chance of heart disease and diabetes and obesity and fatigue and reflux disease if you are treated with hormonal therapy. Now, not every woman can have that. You know, most women who have had breast cancer or ovarian cancer generally are not good candidates for estrogen therapy. So, but, there, but it's there, and now insurances are covering it. And I don't think most people even knew that they didn't cover it.
because what we used to have to do all the time is get prior authorizations for it. So I write a prescription on Monday, and the patient's sitting there waiting and waiting and waiting for the medication, and it takes us 10 days to get something prior off. We don't have to do that anymore. It's now covered. So menopause is one of those things that we all go through. Um, and I'm here to tell you that you can have hot flashes at 50, and you can have hot flashes at 90. And most of you, I remember talking to people all the time, they may not be as intense, but you're still going to get them. So it's not anything that's really wrong with you, it's just you still have hot flashes. Um, the, other, the other thing I want to talk to you about is the, the causes of death. This is kind of morbid, but as you know, heart disease is the number one cause of death in men and women. So one in every three deaths in women over the age of 18 is due to heart. Heart attacks, you know, cerebral, any kind of vascular thing. But one in three, that used to be one in five. When I gave this talk about six, seven years ago, it was one in five. It's now one in three. So look around your table. You know, think about your friends that have high blood pressure, who have had atrial fibrillation, who have had heart attacks, who have had blood clots. You know, any of those things all put you at increased risk. So one in, one in three. Every 33 seconds, someone in the United States dies of a heart attack or a cardiovascular problem. One every 33 seconds. And here's a statistic that I don't like is that we are now 52% of that, and men are only 48. So 52%. It used to be that women were like 49. So we've increased that statistic that we don't like. What's the number two cause of death in women? Men? <laughs> 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 And you'd think it'd be breast cancer, but it's not. It's lung cancer. So the number one cause of death and cancer deaths in women is lung cancer. Breast follows behind that. And now, the number three cause of death in the United States for women? COVID. COVID. These are the studies that just came out in 2000, 2021-22. So that's the third leading cause of death in the United States in women is COVID. But then all these other things kind of trickle down. So we're still seeing a lot of, you know, that's, that includes accidents and suicides and all those other things. So what we have to look at as a group of women is what are we doing to protect ourselves from heart disease? You know, this is a, this is a nice heart healthy lunch. I'm looking for the chocolate. <laughs> said you did it. It's okay. That's all right. I can do it out for a few minutes. Um, so, just to talk about risk stratification, um, and I want to touch on each one of these for a couple of reasons. So, when we look at ourselves, we look at our lives. I don't know about you, but I look in the mirror and I think. Who is that? <laughs> and why was why is that thing down three more inches than it was? <laughs> so you, you kind of just know your body, and you know that there's things that you want to do to make yourself better. So what do you? What are the things that you want to try? And we we all know these. I just want to kind of just bring them out to you because I want to talk about a little bit about them. One is to manage stress. If anybody ever figures out how to do that, please let me know. <laughs> because stress is a major indicator for women. And you know why? Because we take care of everybody else, but we don't take care of ourselves. So everything else we internalize, we bring all that stuff into our bodies, and our bodies have to react somehow. And they do that by being stressed, being depressed, being anxious. How many, is there anybody in here who has no stress in their life? I was waiting for John to lift his hand. <laughs> his wife takes care of him. 
But the, you don't. You can't avoid stress. You just can't. So how you manage that is what's going to help you to decrease your heart risk. So there's three, and this is the easiest thing in the world. There's three things that you can do to decrease your stress. Number one, get a good night's sleep. Sleep better. We all know this. How come we don't do it? Because it's not easy. We are so involved with everything else that's going on in our lives, we can't turn our brains off to sleep. The second one is to exercise. You know, they, they always talk about two and a half hours per week of, of exercise. How many of us really get that in? <laughs> but we know it's wonderful. Did I know that? <laughs> but it's a wonderful thing to do if you can get two and a half hours in a week. That's really only what? A half an hour, five times a week. And they, they have done studies on tons and tons and tons of people that show when you exercise, your stress level decreases by at least 50%. My friend Gary just had surgery on his neck. And the surgeon that did his surgery lives five miles from Cleveland Clinic. He runs to Cleveland Clinic every morning and he runs home at the end of the day. And has done that for 15 years because that's his stress reliever. By the time he gets to work, all of those things that he's processing are there. And by the time he gets home at night, he leaves everything at work. So that's an extreme. I mean, that's extreme. But that's something that we can do. And then the third thing we can do is change our diet. So this is the hard one. We all talk about going to the store now and bringing home one bag of groceries that's 50 bucks. Yeah. <laughs> and I can't imagine how a family of four is surviving today. I just can't. You know, you, you've got to try to buy what you can buy. We know this. We know we're supposed to eat more fruits and vegetables. Why don't we? Because you don't like them. <laughs> you know, it's, it's hard. It's hard. It's hard to maintain a diet of high fruits and vegetables, low fat, low carbs, if you don't plan your menus. If you can get into a regimen where you're planning your menus and planning what you're going to go when you go to the store to buy it, it's not that hard. So why aren't we all skinny? <laughs> because, I'm telling you right now, I'm a meat eater. I can't help it. I, I'm never not going to be a meat eater. I don't eat a lot of carbs, but I got to have a steak every once in a while. And when I live with somebody who right across the road, they raise pen gouges cows, and you know, but it's it's that monitoring the amount of things like you get um, from restaurants. Because we can predict how we're making things at home, so we can kind of cut back on the fat and the sugars and things. But when you go out to eat, you know, you can't you can't determine. I wouldn't even venture a guess on how many calories are in the salad. But you know, it's there's not a whole lot in what we just have for lunch. But it's just that mechanism of trying to change. Here's another study for you. So they did all these nutritionist things and you guys would know this. When you prepare your own meals at home and you use the plate version so that one half of your plate is always fruits and vegetables, one quarter is a carb and one quarter is meat, they've done studies that show that people who are eating that properly balanced diet actually have more energy and less stress. Because it's all of these chemical things that we're putting in our bodies that we can't burn off. You know, and it's just, it's, and here again, we as women are, are notorious for that. Yes, ma'am. It is now because that's all you get. You know, I was telling somebody when I was young, my mom, I'm the youngest of eight kids, and my mom could take a potato and feed eight of us. I mean, I just, I just know she could. But I never had a vegetable that came out of a can until I was 18 years old when I went to college. 
I mean, she canned everything, bone canned, even including our meat that we used. But I remember eating a bite of corn, and I looked at my friends that were sitting there, and they were like, I'm like, what is, it? What is this stuff that we're eating? <laughs> and, you know, yeah, and it's just, and it's getting worse and worse and worse. You know, you look at the back of these, um, the boxes and things that tells you what's in it, and you have, you know, you have a can of chicken, and like the first thing that's in it is water. <laughs> that's your main ingredient, it's water, it's not chicken, there's something wrong with that, and then the salt. But you're absolutely right, it's all processed stuff. And if you eat out a lot, look at them. You know? I told somebody before, I said, I'm never going to be skinny. I, I'm pretty healthy. I mean, I'm, I'm overweight, but I am pretty healthy. I can stick up with most people in a lot of different things. And it's not so much that it's a weight thing, it's how you feel physically right. to do that. But fruits and vegetables. And then the other thing is um, getting mental health care. Mental health care in this country is still a stigma. You know, people are afraid to go say to their doctor or to a friend or to their pastor or to whoever, I'm depressed, I'm anxious, I'm thinking about, I don't wanna hurt myself. Because immediately people think you're crazy. And if you don't manage a mental health issue that you have, all this other stuff means nothing because everything else is gonna snowball on you. So you're gonna have more stress. You're not gonna be sleeping. You're gonna have more fatigue. You're gonna have more irritable bowel. You're gonna have, you know, it's all those things come after that. So, I mean, that's, and you know, we look at, and it's very, it's very sad to look at what's going on in our society right now. I never thought that I would ever see the United States looking like this, ever. And I'm sure both of you believe the same thing. But it's because we're not treating the right problems. Amen. You know, and we need to we need to really uh, talk to our friends and talk to our neighbors, talk to our kids and grandkids and, and find out where they're at. I don't know if you know now, I'm, I'm the deputy coroner now too. And um, we had, I, I just can't believe the number of suicides we had in Asheville County last year. I mean, it just blows me away. And they're not all young people, and they're not all women, they're not all men, but they're, I mean, it's, it's just amazing that the, the mental health issues. And we as women, what's the first thing we do when something happens to us? It goes right inside, because we don't share that with anybody. <laughs> and you know, nobody has to answer, but I just think in your brain, if something were to happen to you today, and you got into a situation where you needed help, how many of you actually have a person you can call within five minutes and they'll be right there with you? I'm right there too. But you know, a lot of people are not. They don't have that support system. So all of this stuff, all this stuff just kind of keeps festering. So I don't want to be, I don't want to be a downer. So the good news is, here's the good news. So we are seeking help more. And the fact that um, as we get older, there are more um, opportunities for us to, to take things like this, take classes, you know, talk to people. You know, I don't think in our county we're as bad of a physician shortage as we are in a lot of other places. Uh, so we have that opportunity to, to get care when we need it. But if you look at the health indicators 10 years from now, we're going to be about 20 to 30 percent short of physicians because they're all getting old like me. And the young kids that are coming out, they all want to be specialists. You know, they don't want to be family docs, they don't want to be uh, gynecologists. You know, they want to go into something like the surgeries and the, and the pulmonology and the cardiology things. So we're, we're actually going to have a shortage even here in this county that's even going to increase in the next 10, you know, 10 years or so. Um, environmental impact. I wake up every morning and I am so blessed that I have a home. I have food. I have people that love me. I have cats. So I have, I have all of those blessings that I have. But think about... Think about 10 to 15% of people in this country 
are still almost homeless. And I don't mean homeless living on the street. I mean homeless because they have to go back and live with their parents. Or parents have to come and live with their kids. Or you've got, you know, 10 or 15 people living in a home. So, you know, they, those are the people that are going to fall through the cracks later on. Um, oh, here's an interesting one. How many of you have been to the dentist in the last uh, year? So, the majority of people have their hands up. And maybe the ones that don't have their hands up, they have dentures, so they don't have to go to the dentist. <laughs> you know? So, but there's a, there's a large population, again, it's women, who are getting major medical problems because they're walking around with teeth that are rotting out of their mouth because they can't afford to have dentists even because they don't have dental insurance. And I don't think a lot of the, even the managed cares don't have dental insurance. We were blessed at ACMC, we have dental insurance. And I use every <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. Um, the other issue that we're seeing more and more in women that we didn't see 15 years ago is substance abuse and polysubstance abuse. So polysubstance abuse would be things like alcohol and marijuana, methamphetamines, heroin, crystal meth, coke. I mean, there's a large population in this county um, of women who are actually greater than the age of 40 who are polysubstance abusers. So we're seeing a little bit more of that. Um, and then just, this is for all of our daughters and granddaughters. Do you know that there's still 40% of women who are not getting prenatal care until like three months? And the reason is, is because you call the gynecologist and you say, hey, I'm pregnant. How far along are you? Oh, about 10 weeks. Well, come and see me in a month. Because there's not enough, there's not enough doctors to take care of them. So they're just you know, they're prescribing you prenatal vitamins, and they're you know, these kids are just not getting any education like they used to. So again, you're going to run into all of this stuff. Um, so if you have a piece of paper or pencil, if you're like me, you have to write things down because I don't remember things a lot. But I just want you, to, I want to give you some numbers that you want to remember, and then talk to your doctor about. One of them, these are again, these are all risk factors for developing heart disease or making heart disease worse. The first one is blood pressure. Ideally, your blood pressure should be less than 130 over 80. So there's two numbers on your blood pressure. The top number is how much blood and how forceful your heart works to push all that blood out of your heart to the rest of your body. It's called the systolic pressure. The diastolic pressure is the bottom number, and that is called a filling pressure. So it's from all your veins working everywhere, pulling that blood back up into your heart so that the top part can push it out. That's a diastolic. So 130 over 80 is the number that you want to reach or less. Okay. Um, as we get a little bit older, a lot of a lot of folks will come in and their blood pressures are 150, 160, and they think that's an okay thing. Well, that's an okay thing if it's just like a one-time thing. I can't tell you the number of patients I've had to go out into the car to check their blood pressure because when they come into my office, it's 20 points high. So, but 130 over 80 is the goal you want to reach. The second, the second number you want to remember is your blood sugar. A fasting blood sugar should be less than 100. Okay? We used to say less than 120. Now, you know, less than 100 is the goal, is where we're looking at. And that's for diabetic or not diabetic. We want to shoot for about 100. Um, your cholesterol levels. Cholesterols are a big indicator of heart disease because cholesterol. You, know, you think you look down an old drain it's got crud around it you know it doesn't drain very well that crud around that is called plaque inside your arteries and that plaque will build up if your cholesterol is high and that's what breaks off when you have a heart attack or a stroke 
So there's four different numbers they generally give you for your cholesterol. One is a total cholesterol, then they'll give you like a triglyceride number, and an LDL number, and an HDL. So the one that you want to keep in the back of your mind is that LDL, and now we're looking, it used to be less than 130. Now we're looking at an LDL, ideally less than 100, which is pretty low. They're talking about more and more people getting on these statin drugs to get that down, and it's a study showed that they work. They're not real easy to take sometimes. They cause you a lot of muscle aches and pains. And, um, the other number is your uh, body mass index, your BMI, should be less than 25. I have never been there, will never be there. <laughs> I will be if I cut my leg off. <laughs> but you know, you gotta have you gotta have a goal. So less than 25. Now your your BMI, your body mass index, is a measurement of uh, your height related to your weight. I always tell somebody that you know I'm just too short for my weight. <laughs> so you know, if you get a little bit taller, there your BMI is not going to be so bad. So, but 25 is the 25 is the number. <laughs> If you are over 29, then you are actually classified as morbidly obese. And there's nothing worse than a doctor putting on your letter morbid obesity. Believe me, it hurts me too. But that's but those are the numbers you want to remember. Um, oh, here's another interesting thing. Probably the majority of you here don't smoke. And I'm not going to ask people if they smoke or not, because I'm not going to embarrass anybody. I'm a little smoker. I used to smoke two packs a day. I quit smoking 30 years ago. But I liked it. I smoked it all the way to the filter. <laughs> but what's happening now is people are not smoking cigarettes, they're vaping. Yeah. You know, and I think that's the most disgusting thing. Because now all of those chemicals that's in that vape. You know, they're still selling that cheap stuff, and it's got it's full of oils. So you're inhaling oil into your lungs, and that's what these kids are going into pulmonary edema and congestive heart failure, and because they're and vaping all of this oils in their system, and they're thinking that these kids are vaping like a pen a day, which is like two packs of cigarettes. It's the equivalent of a couple packs. So we're, we're getting more into vaping, and I'm hoping nobody vapes. Because I will in there, not um, And then the other thing is, if you're going to drink alcohol, less than one drink per day. Now, now, what, now I have to quantify that. So one drink a day is six ounces of wine. Six ounces of wine. Come on. Not a bottle. Not a bottle. So five or six ounces, and then or one beer, twelve ounce. Or a shot. I don't know how much is in a shot of liquor. Is there anything? Okay, let's see that. Look at me, I should jump on that one right now. Story CC. Is that the many ways to go? Isn't it? Is 30 cc is that an ounce? 30 cc is an ounce, I think, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. So one drink a day. Um, does anybody have any questions? I know I'm talking a lot. A couple things on the new health indicators. One thing that we're going to have to talk about is preventive health care. So you know, I got, I have to, I have to push this. So colonoscopies. Nobody, nobody likes them. I know. <laughs> you who? Nobody likes them. But they're now starting colonoscopies at age forty. Can I get my iced tea? <coughs> So, to get a colonoscopy at this point in your life should be just like driving a car to the store. Everyone's probably been through at least one. Um, the prep is always the worst. Yes, ma'am. After what age should you not get them anymore? I was going to get to that. They have um, the new guidelines actually are after age seventy-five, and if you have if you have a colonoscopy at age sixty-six and it's normal, they'll tell you to come back in ten years. You'll be seventy-six. You don't need it. <laughs> <laughs> That's what my doctor said. 
Yes. <laughs> so, and the question, I always get questions about that cola bar. Well, you poop in the box and you mail it back to me. <laughs> no, it actually, it actually doesn't. But that, they, they originally came out with Cola Guard. It was a money-making scheme for people. But it actually was a fairly good screening test if you have nothing that deals with colon cancer. It does not tell you that you don't have a polyp. And sometimes, you know, polyps, 33% of polyps can advance to, to colon cancer. So if you have absolutely no family history, you have absolutely no problems with your bowel movements, and there's no indication that you need to do any other testing, the colobar is not a bad screening test. It does not replace a, a colonoscopy. So colonoscopy is usually every three to five years if you have a polyp. If it's a, an abnormal polyp that is cancerous, they'll usually do one, one another year or so. But other than that, it's every 10. Um, mammograms. Same age. We generally start at age 40, unless you have a family history of uh, breast cancer. Then we start 10 years previous to the person that was the youngest. For example, my sister was um, 45. I have three sisters with breast cancer. All of them were survivors, praise the Lord. But she was 45 when she developed her breast cancer. So I've been having mammograms every year since age 35. So that goes up until you're about 75, too. However, when your doctor says, oh, you're 75, you don't have to have a mammogram. <laughs> if you feel like you want a mammogram, you get one, because your insurance will cover it. So don't, I mean, don't ever think that somebody's going to stop you from getting a mammogram. Because I, you can still get, and here, this is the terrible part. If you get breast cancer after the age of 75, statistics show that you'll die of something else before breast cancer. So that's why they pick that number. And it's the same thing with men who have prostate cancer. They say, oh, after that, you know, you're going to have prostate cancer, but something else will kill me first. I always, I, those of you who are my patients, you know, I push, I push mammograms, don't I? Yep. <laughs> um, but that's, and then pap smears. Pap smears have a really bad history because if you don't, if you don't have a technique that you're getting good tissue sample, a pap smear is useless. So if your doctor does not do pap smears on you, make sure you go to a gynecologist. Because between the ages, as soon as you start reproductive um, years, usually 21, 22, if you are sexually active, don't do a pap smear. And we do those all the way up to age 70, 75. If you have a family history or a personal history of having abnormal paps, then we do them until you can't get your leg up there bent well enough. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. Uh, after the age of 70, you can't have a mammogram. That's a great question. Because if you had, the question is, do you have to have a pap smear after you've had a complete hysterectomy? Unless that complete hysterectomy was for cancer, you never need another pap smear. There's nothing to, I don't know what they're happening. <laughs> Now, that's, there's a difference between doing the exam and doing the swab. Because I will still check someone who's had, a pat, or who's had a hysterectomy, especially if they've got a dropped bladder or they've got what's called atrophic vaginitis, which is a drying of the vagina. I, still, I would still check that. It's just that swab is for, is for cervix. That's looking for a cervical thing. So if you, and you can talk to your gynecologist. I know they still do them on people who've had complete hysterectomies, but I, I'm not sure what they're swabbing when they do that. But they should, they should go in there and get a look, because you can still have, I mean, you can still develop vulvar cancer, you know, the labia, and you can still develop cancer. doesn't mean that they're not going to look. It just means you just don't need that specific. And you don't, and if you've never had an abnormal pap, you probably don't need one. She said her gynecologist doesn't do them after 70, and if you've never had an abnormal, you probably don't need one. So, but those are the preventative things. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. I think I covered the majority of the stuff I wanted to talk about. Um, does anybody have any questions for me? Yes, ma'am. So, Dr. Bishop, so not the last year, but I, I've been wondering about this because in the last two 
years, I've known four ladies who are all like over the age of 70, some 75, 80. They've all had some type of female cancer. Mm -hmm. So if you're not having a pap test, but you should still go to the gynecologist or, because I know that's something as we get older, like that's something like. Yeah, so it's two different things we're going to talk about. Okay. One is just a vaginal exam. So you use a speculum, you go in there, you grab a look at all the tissue. You see anything abnormal, you can grab a, a specimen of it. The pap smear is an actual test where we go in with a swab or a brush and go into the cervix to get into cervical tissue and then send that away. So you should be having a vaginal exam. And if you had a complete hysterectomy at least every two or three years, unless you're having problems or not having problems, but you don't need that actual little pap smear that they do. Do you see how my hand is like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> I swear to God, you're talking in and out, it's not, I can't talk. <laughs> but yeah, you're, but you did, but so it's two different exams that you have. So most gynecologists will do exams until they just don't do them anymore, but they may not do that past year. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, even if you're on medication, that should be the highest number you have. Did you hear over here? Yeah, what her question was, if you're on medication for blood pressure, she, do you still go by the 130 over 80, and that's correct. Because that's the goal to keep it down below there. Oh, yes, ma'am. Will there ever be a time when the doctor is going to go into holistic medicine? I can't take the medicines that they give me at the doctor's office because I am allergic to them. I've ended up in the hospital after taking the medicine. And uh, so for me to take the chemicals that are in the medicine, it hurts my body. Now, there, are, there are several homeopathic physicians in this area. And what they do is they treat not with a medication, but they treat with herbal medicines and plant type medicines. So they are available in Asheville County. A lot of regular physicians like me in my office, I mean, my patients and I've talked about some natural things to do. But if you're one of those specific people that can't take this stuff, you just look under a uh, holistic yes. physician. And get, but there are several. I can't think of their names right now, but there's at least two of them in Asheville. Anybody, any of you guys know those holistic People. There's two. There's two different holistic um, doctors in Asheville County. They're not associated with any hospital or anything. I think they're independent, but they use more herbal and more plant-based um, medications to treat. And the reason that they can do that is because the majority of the medicines you take are plant come from plants. Yes, and come from I, have no, I have no problem. If it grows on Earth, I have no problem with it. But when they put the chemicals in it. Oh. I, I would tell you that most of the physicians, and including me, I, I write medications that are processed. I can make, I don't know enough about a lot of these herbal medicines to tell you one way or another, but I know that I've referred people to um, homeopathic and holistic medicines right here in the county. And I believe Cleveland Clinic has some that they're doing telemedicine with their homeopathic. Oh, that's right. So if you go on the Cleveland Clinic's website and do a search homeopathic, I think you can find somebody also there. And there, there are actually a couple of the new family docs that are here. I think Dr. Facolati does a lot of. And Dr. Williams. In and Dr. Williams and Connie and Dr. Facolati here in Astabula. I think they use a lot of natural things too. And so does Peggy Reinhardt. And Peggy does, yeah. Peggy, Peggy does. uses a lot of those things too. So there, there are people out there, um, but there, there are specific holistic medications or homeopathic physicians that you can look at. But yeah, I didn't know. I didn't know about the Cleveland Clinic one. They're doing tele now. I believe what they're calling. Oh, nice. I think that they have one. one position. Yeah, that's pretty nice. Any other questions? We have one. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, ma'am. If you had a hysterectomy, but you still have a surgery, can you get a pap? Yes. Yes, ma'am. 
because you still have that air, you still have those endocervical cells that need to be tested. And I don't know why they used to do that all the time. They used to, and I, and I think the process behind why they would leave the cervix is so that you have that um, suspension there for the, the bladder, so you wouldn't get a, a drop bladders relatively easily. So, but they used to do that all the time. I don't know if they do it a whole lot anymore. Any other questions? Well, I really appreciate your time, and I hope that some of the information I gave you is helpful. Um, you know, I, I think as a, a group of individuals, you coming here is probably a good indication that you want to stay healthy. And, you know, you, you're all, I mean, the people that I know here that I've taken care of for years that may come after me. <laughs> um, but I, I mean, they're very, they were very involved with their care, and they're very involved with um, finding out what's, what's the best way to, to treat themselves. And I think probably all of you are the same way, and that's just the way we have to be. Because we have to take care of ourselves, guys. Ladies, not guys. <laughs> we have to take care of ourselves because, you know, we can't, we can't rely on everybody else trying to, to do what's best for us. We have to be our own our own advocates in so many ways. That's just the reality of that. But anyway, thank you so much. Thank you.